All right, so we are now at the top of the hour, and so we'll get this webinar started. Welcome to this IAS USA webinar. Today is Tuesday, August 30th, 2022. My name is Jose Francisco, and I'm a project manager at IAS USA. We are excited to cover today's presentation on what you need to know about the diagnosis and treatment of human monkeypox virus. This is part one of our two-part monkeypox webinar series, and part two will be on Thursday, and we'll provide a epidemiologic and public health update on monkeypox. For today's webinar, we are delighted um, to have Dr. Um, Jason Zucker from Columbia University who will be presenting this webinar, and the question and answer session at the end will be moderated by Drs. Marshall Gillespie and Haiti Torres from Wild Cornell Medicine. And we would now like to introduce Dr. Gillespie, who will be going over our introduction slides. Welcome, Dr. Gillespie. Thank you so much, Jose, and welcome, everybody. We're delighted to have you on today's uh, webinar. And uh, along with my colleague, Katie Torres, pleased to uh, uh, get us started. Let's go to the next slide, please. So as Jose mentioned, this is the first of a two-part series. The next webinar will be Thursday of this week. and. Uh, will also be uh, really a great session featuring Dr. Jay Varma, who directs the uh, Wild Cornell Center for Pandemic Prevention and Response. He's uh, someone who spent a significant part of his career at uh, CDC and was the COVID advisor to Mayor de Blasio in New York City and has extraordinary public health experience. And we'll be sharing uh, his knowledge about the epidemiology and public health response to the current monkeypox outbreak. So please join us on Thursday. This slide uh, has the financial relationships of the content on the web board members. And these are uh, our disclosures. Today's uh, program is accredited for 1.25 AMA PRA category one uh, CME credits. And there are also uh, uh, MOC points for uh, the ABIM nursing, and pharmacy uh, credits as well. We are pleased to acknowledge uh, generous support for this activity from uh, the supporters, contributors uh, listed on this slide. And as usual, this webinar is being recorded and uh, the recording and slides should be available within 24 hours of uh, today's event. Uh, in terms of uh, logistics, uh, there will be a, several poll questions. It'll be kind of obvious what to do. The questions will just pop up and you click on your answer. And then Dr. Zucker will review the uh, responses afterwards. It, uh, during the uh, webinar, please submit questions during uh, real time uh, using the Q&A button rather than the chat button. We will do our best to address as many questions as possible, particularly focusing on the content that Dr. Zucker will be uh, uh, focusing on today, uh, rather than some of the topics that will be covered on Thursday by Dr. Varma. And uh, we apologize in advance if we're not able to uh, answer all of the questions that are submitted. The uh, chat will be open. It could be used for conversations with other attendees, uh, or if you're having an issue with audio, something like that. But please don't submit questions in the chat box. Please use the Q&A box for, for questions. It's really uh, my privilege now to introduce uh, today's speaker, my friend and colleague, Dr. Jason Zucker, who is Assistant Professor of Medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases at Columbia University College of Physicians and Sur uh, Surgeons, as well as uh, New York Presbyterian Columbia University Irving Medical S uh, Center. He's also the Assistant Medical Director of the New York City STD Prevention and Training Center. Dr. Zucker is trained in both adult and pediatric infectious diseases and has an experienced HIV, HIV prevention, and sexual health care provider. And I'd venture to say that he probably has seen more cases of human monkeypox infection than uh, almost anyone else in this country. So take it away, uh, Jason. Dr. Zucker, you are currently muted. There you go. And you can see my slides all right? Yes, we are. Excellent. So good afternoon. I want to just start by thanking the organizers and moderators for having me today. And thanks so many of you for taking your time out of your busy days to discuss this important and evolving topic, what you need to know about the diagnosis and treatment of human monkeypox virus. 
So to get, into, to get a sense of where we're starting, I want to ask how many uh, patients with human monkeypox virus have you diagnosed? I'll give you a few seconds to answer. So the goal is that this presentation will hopefully be beneficial for everyone from the 54% who have not yet seen a patient with human monkeypox virus to the greater than uh, or the 3% of people who've seen greater than 10 cases. The hope is that this will be helpful for everybody. The goals for today are to recognize the presentation of human monkeypox virus in the 2022 outbreak, review how to diagnose human monkeypox virus, and develop familiarity with treatment options for the human monkeypox virus. I also want to highlight that you won't see a lot about vaccination on here. I'm, going to, I'm not going to go into depth on the vaccines, and we'll leave most of that to Dr. Varma's talk in part two of this series. Our first pretest question. You have a patient who presents with human monkeypox virus, which has been confirmed by assay. Which of the following medications is recommended as the first line for this patient requiring treatment during the 2022 outbreak? So it looks like about 86% of people said tegovirumat, 5% said acyclovir, 3% sidopavir, and 5% uh, vaccine immunoglobulin. And we'll make sure we cover the answer later during this presentation. The second pretest question is you have a patient asking uh, how he can prevent getting human monkeypox virus. Which of the following ways do you tell him is the most common way human monkeypox virus is spread during this current outbreak? Looks like 99% of people said direct contact with infected lesions or body fluids and 1% for long face-to-face -face encounters. And we'll cover this as well. So to get started, as with COVID infection, infection or as with COVID, infectious diseases outbreaks can happen quickly. And that's what happened here. In early May, the first case was confirmed outside of endemic areas in England. And this was quickly followed by other cases around the world, including the first US case about one month later. And what was just a few cases initially has turned quickly into a worldwide pandemic with over 48,800 cases as of last night's reporting. The vast majority of cases in countries in which this was previously non-endemic. This rapid increase led the World Health Organization to declare a public health emergency of international concern by July 23rd, just 10 weeks after that first case was reported. And once again, the United States is at the center of this outbreak. The United States has over 18,000 cases as of last night and remains number one in the world. This led to, on August 4th, the United States declaring the human monkeypox virus a public health emergency, freeing up needed resources. Within the United States, New York City remains oh, is actually now number two with almost 3,200 cases. And as a sexual health practitioner in New York City, it's been my privilege to care for many of these patients and be able to share what I've learned with everyone today whose cases may only be starting to increase. So I want to tell you a little bit about my first case of human monkeypox virus. This patient presented in mid-June, so early on, when there were few U.S. cases. And there are a lot of features to this patient that I now recognize as common to this outbreak. I also mentioned here that this patient and many of the others you'll hear about today are real. While I've changed their names and identifying details, these are all patients who gave me permission to share their stories in hopes that their experience can benefit others. So we'll get started with John. John is in his mid-30s and identifies as a cisgender male. He's living with long-term, well-controlled HIV. He's sexually active with men and four recent partners. All are partners he's known for a long time. And this all started when he noticed some mild eye irritation that he thought was allergies. 
Three days later, he started to feel warm and found that he had a temperature of 100.7. He had some worsening eye redness and drainage, and he actually thought it could have been from a recent sexual encounter where he got some bodily fluids in his eye. It turns out that that partner had just told him that he recently tested positive for gonorrhea and chlamydia. And so John's primary concern was about having gonorrhea or chlamydia infection in his eye. He went to the emergency department the following day, and this is what his eye looked like at the time. And as you can see, he had pretty significant conjunctival injection. In the emergency room, they did the following workup. They tested his urine for gonorrhea and chlamydia, which came back negative. They tested him for syphilis that returned positive with a titer of one to four, consistent with, a, with his previously treated syphilis infection. His HIV viral load was undetectable as it had been for several years. His CD4 count was 282, down from 543, which was attributed to his acute infection. He was treated with one gram of ceftriaxone, a higher dose than standard for his gonorrhea exposure in order to treat a presumed ocular infection and was also given doxycycline for seven days for his chlamydia exposure. Ophthalmology was also called and recommended eye drops and follow up in their outpatient clinic. Two days later, about six days after symptoms started, he was seen in the ophthalmology clinic. This is a lesion from that visit and I hope you can see that he has pustular lesions along the lower lid margin. They completed a gonorrhea chlamydia swab of the eye, which also returned negative, and a bacterial culture of the eye, which also returned negative. They recommended ongoing antibiotic ointment and drops. That same day, he messaged me and asked if he could walk into sexual health clinic because he wanted me to look at his eye and test him for further for sexually transmitted infections. I agreed, although admittedly was glad he'd seen ophthalmology already. However, when he came to clinic, he told our triage staff they had a weird rash with lesions on his left wrist, left forearm, left shoulder, and scrotum. On my initial exam, this rash had lesions in several different forms, a pustule, a macdule, and an ulcerated lesion. We thought about human monkeypox virus at the time. However, at that time, testing was only really available to those who had traveled to Europe. He had not, or had partners that had traveled to Europe or had been known exposures. Since none of his partners had traveled to Europe and none of them had unusual lesions, he was not tested at that time. In terms of my workup, I started by ruling out common causes. I did a herpes and varicella swab of the pustule and sent to bacterial culture. I completed his three-site STI testing and just want to highlight that his throat was positive for gonorrhea, reminding us of the importance of extra genital testing. I also did a respiratory pathogen panel that was positive for rhinovirus or enterovirus. Because his gonorrhea was still positive, although it was a few days early, I did repeat his dose of ceftriaxone and because of the concern for bacterial infection of the eye, continued doxycycline while cultures were pending. And I told him to stay in close touch. He didn't respond to my text over the weekend, but the following week was seen in an ophthalmology clinic. At that time, he reported worsening eye symptoms with swelling, redness, and blurry vision. And he told the ophthalmologist that he had an increasing number of these skin lesions with new lesions on his extremities, genitals, and feet. Repeat optho exam continued to show those lesions along the lower lid margin. He messaged me the next day and in concert with the Department of Health, we were able to arrange to bring him in for human monkeypox virus testing. During this second visit, these are the photos from that visit. On the left, you see two lesions on his forearm. The one closer to his wrist was there at our first visit. And that's the one I swabbed for HSV, HSV, VZV and culture. The one further up the arm was new at the second visit. He also had two lesions on his face that were not there the last time I saw him. These are the papule and ulcerated lesion both on his back. The papule would be very easily confused with acne or other inflammatory skin conditions. I ended up swabbing the wrist lesion and this papule on his back for human monkeypox virus. And finally, on day 17 of his illness, his testing came back positive from both swabs. By this time, when I called to tell him his results, he reported that his eye was almost entirely better and the skin lesions were already healing. He went on to have no ongoing vision issues and healed completely and was able to return to his daily life. But as you'll see from this first case, it really highlights a lot of the important parts of the virus that we'll cover as we review today. So now that you've heard about the first case, let's take a step back and talk about what is human monkeypox virus. 
So human monkeypox virus is an orthopox virus. This means that it's similar to smallpox, but not smallpox. This is important because it means that many treatments and vaccines for smallpox have the potential to work against human monkeypox virus as well. There are many orthopox viruses that we know about, including variola or smallpox, vaccinia, which is what the smallpox vaccine is based on, cowpox, and many other animal orthopox viruses. There are two virus clades, clade one, which was formerly referred to as the Central African clade, which has a mortality rate as high as 10%, and clade two formerly referred to as the West African clade with a much lower mortality rate of around 1%. This outbreak has been primarily of a clade two-like virus. Because of our recent experience with SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19, it's also important to highlight what this virus is not. It's not a novel virus. It was first discovered in Africa in 1958 in research monkeys, which is where the name comes from. However, that name is really a misnomer as the natural reservoir is unknown and it's known to infect both non-human primates and African rodents. The first human case was described in 1970 in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And before this outbreak, nearly all cases were able to be linked to travel to Central and Western Africa. It's also important to highlight that this is not the first US outbreak. The first major US outbreak was in 2003, which included 47 cases and traced back to pet prairie dogs. What all this means to us is that in spite of this outbreak feeling novel, we're not starting from scratch, which is how in just three months I can talk to you today about testing, treatment, and vaccination options. So how does human monkeypox virus transmit? In terms of transmission, it's important to highlight that it's not easily transmissible. It can be transmitted from animals to humans like the prairie dogs I mentioned earlier, through direct contact with infected lesions or body fluid, contaminated fomites, bites or scratches from the animal, and ingestion of animal products. While animal to human transmission occurs, in this case, we're more likely talking about human to human transmission. This occurs primarily through three ways. Direct contact with infected lesions or body fluid, contaminated fomites, and exposure to respiratory secretions. So whenever I list these three routes of transmission, I get all sorts of questions about, can I get human monkeypox virus in the bus or subway, in the grocery store, in the clothing store, at the gym, the salon, the classroom, or any other place I frequently go? And the answer is probably not. While I list out three ways for this virus to transmit, the epidemiology of this disease really focuses on one way, direct contact with infected lesions or body fluids through close personal skin-to-skin -skin contact with rashes or scabs, those things that can occur during sex are by far the most common way to acquire human monkeypox virus. While contaminated fomites, particularly soft and porous items, and respiratory secretions are all reported and potential ways of transmission, it's not what we're seeing during this outbreak. And we know that when we look at the epidemiology, this is an example from New York City where the vast majority of infections are in men who have sex with men. There are few children and individuals born female infected, which is not what you would expect in a crowded city that uses a lot of mass transportation if this was transmitting other than through close physical contact. If fomites and respiratory secretions were significant drivers of spread, we would expect much more varied epidemiology. And I wanna be clear that anyone can get human monkeypox virus, but that's just not what we're seeing. As the overall numbers increase, we're seeing an incredibly slow expansion of the epidemiology with very few women and children infected. In fact, we're still seeing news reports each time another child tests positive. And currently out of the over 18,000 US cases, there have been only 17 children under the age of 17 diagnosed so far. I do want to highlight this one study that focuses on the household attack rate or the rate of persons living with an infected person that develops symptoms of human monkeypox virus infection. This is because many of the children who have been diagnosed are household contacts of individuals previously diagnosed. In this study, they found an attack rate of 50% within families, the majority being children with a high number and extremely young children. And while this attack rate and transmission observed in the study reinforce the importance of surveillance and rapid identification, it also supports that a lot of these diseases, a lot of these infections outside of the primary epidemiological groups are going to be household infections. And while household spread does and has occurred, household spread is often a dead end 
and we're not seeing further propagation of disease outside the household. So now that we covered how it spreads, let's take a second and talk about how it presents. So this is the classic presentation of what you would have expected to see if you read a book on human monkeypox virus. The disease starts with a viral prodrome, similar to many viral illnesses. This includes fevers, chills, headache, malaise, myalgias, and lymphadenopathy. After the prodrome, patients usually develop a rash. The rash occurs usually before day five and most frequently between days one and three. The rashes are firm, deep-seated, well-circumscribed, and sometimes umbilicated lesions that can be very painful. They classically start on the face and spread to the extremities, including the palms and soles. And they classically progress through several synchronized stages. They can last up to four weeks before healing. So this is my classic human monkeypox virus timeline. And it starts with an incubation period of five to 21 days. That means that after a significant exposure, it can be up to 21 days before you have any symptoms, although they most frequently occur around day six to seven. That's followed by the prodrome we described earlier, consistent with many other viral illnesses, followed by an anathem, which are lesions that start in the mouth. During this period, you can have infectious virus in your mouth that can spread through kissing and oral contact before you may realize that you are infected. That's followed by macules, which are flat lesions on the skin. Because they're small and flat, they're very easy to miss. These are followed by papules, which are solid and superficial and not yet fluid filled. They're usually less than one centimeter in size and can be easily confused with acne. These can then progress to vesicles, which are also small and filled with clear fluid. Finally, or next progressing to pustules, which are filled with a darker fluid consistent with pus. They can also become umbilicated in this stage, as you can see in the bottom two pictures, developing a hole in the center, which is relatively classic for this disease. After that, they start to scab. It's important to know that these scabs are still infectious and still harbor a lot of infectious virus in them. Patients are not considered fully resolved and no longer infectious until the scabs have fallen off and there's fresh new skin underneath. Because of this, the infectious period is long. The infectious period lasts from when the prodromal symptoms start until the scabs fall off. Patients can be infectious for as long as 28 days or longer, which makes this disease very challenging both on the providers and on the patients who need to isolate for long periods of time. So to understand how human monkeypox virus is presenting during this outbreak, we can look at a few of the case series that have been published so far. I did my best to put some of these findings into a table to help us see some of the trends. One of the first things that it's obvious is that the majority of cases in this outbreak are male. Greater than 95% of cases compared to about one third in a recent African case series. This is likely related to how the disease is transmitted across networks more than anything about the virus itself. Another important thing to note that's not on this table is that a disproportionate percentage of patients, around 40% across studies, are persons living with HIV. Second, is that while we're going to hear about a lot of other symptoms, the rash is still common and prevalent in most patients. However, what you can't get from the table is that in some cases, the rash appears after other symptoms instead of being the initial symptom. One of these major symptoms is rectal pain, presenting as practitis with and without tenesmus. Occurring between 14 and 36% in these case series, it is one of the major unique symptoms of this outbreak and can cause debilitating pain for patients. And that symptom fits with the lesion location. The majority of patients have lesions on their genitals or anal and perianal regions. These are frequently the locations the rash begins, differentiating it from the classic presentation. What's also interesting is that we're not seeing a huge number of lesions like in some of the African case series. In this case, the median number of lesions is around or less than 10. I also wanna highlight some of these more severe disease presentations because monkeypox is and can be a severe disease. 
And I wanna again, thank our patients for providing us permission to share their stories and images to help providers take better care of patients and provide a warning that some images on the next few slides will be graphic. The first manifestation I wanna highlight is less severe, but not less important. And it's this viral-like example. We're seeing this in numerous patients and it was not reported prior to this outbreak, but tends to improve as the patients improve. It's important to think about this because it look, can look like many other viral or other infectious exanthems. And it can also look like a drug rash if you're not looking out for it prior to starting any medical treatment. Next, I wanna highlight what are commonly being reported as the most common severe manifestations of this disease, which include things like proctitis, urethritis, pharyngitis, lymphadenopathy, bacterial superinfection, and encephalitis. So as I mentioned already, proctitis has been one of the major presenting symptoms of this disease and one of the most common severe manifestations I'm seeing in my practice. Proctitis can appear before the rash, complicating the diagnosis in the United States where commercial labs are not approved for testing via rectal swab. These patients are presenting an excruciating pain often holding going to the bathroom because the pain is so severe. While many patients have external lesions, some patients will have severe pain without external lesions, so they're not easily visible. One of our patients early in the pandemic who was diagnosed, uh, presented with rectal pain and bleeding and failed to improve after greater than one week. So we actually did a sigmoidoscopy to look for other causes. The sigmoidoscopy showed a local area of severe inflammation with erythema, friable mucus, and shallow ulcerations with an exudate extending 15 centimeters from the anal verge. Pathology at that time was negative for all of our typical pathogens, leading us to believe that all of this pathology was caused by the human monkeypox virus and took this patient almost two full weeks to get better. The next severe presentation we're seeing is urethritis. Patients presenting with dysuria and testing negative for typical STI pathogens is common. This particular patient presented with such severe dysuria that he was trying to avoid going to the bathroom due to the extreme pain. As you can see from the photo, when he opened his urethral meatus, you can actually see lesions from the human monkeypox virus there. And these are likely what were being irritated during urination. And so you can see one lesion where the arrow is and a second lesion further up. Next on our list of severe presentations is pharyngitis. I don't have a picture of pharyngeal lesions because we haven't done a flex uh, laryngoscope so far, but this is a lesion on a patient's hard palate who also was having severe dysphagia. We've had multiple patients present with pharyngitis to the point that they've been unable to swallow. And at our site, inability to take oral intake has been one of the primary reasons we've had to admit patients. Lymphadenopathy is a hallmark of this disease. And one of the things that was useful to separate it from smallpox. Lymphadenopathy, in my experience, often presents wherever the initial lesions are, so cervical for patients with pharyngitis and inguinal or femoral for patients with genital lesions. The lymphadenopathy can also be so significant and painful. This is a patient who came in and it was obvious that he was struggling to walk when he walked in the door, and he told me it felt like he was walking with a fanny pack around his waist. In addition to lymphadenopathy, it's also likely that we're seeing or lymphadenopathy from the virus itself. It's also likely that we're seeing additional lymphadenopathy from bacterial superinfection. We've seen numerous lesions, including genital and perirectal lesions that have been consistent with bacterial superinfection and for which we've treated with antibiotics. I'll put in a plug here for including bacterial cultures in your list of diagnostics, as we've found a variety of organisms and resistance patterns and upfront cultures have been really helpful in directing therapy lane. <clears throat> I'll also say that while we did not visualize it, we've had two patients that presented with symptoms consistent with pharyngeal superinfection that also improved on antibiotics. It appears that bacterial superinfection of these lesions may be a relatively common presentation that providers should be aware of. I also want to highlight the importance of interdisciplinary care in taking care of these complicated patients. In the top left, you see a patient with a deep penile lesion for which urology consultation provided invaluable advice. On the bottom left, you can see confluent facial lesions that we are concerned for possible future facial scarring and appreciate our dermatology colleagues who provided guidance. The bottom middle is a patient with perichondritis 
or viral infection of the ear, presumably through direct inoculation. This patient required input from both ENT and dermatology and remains one of our most complex patients to date. Finally, on the right side are the ocular manifestations of this disease, like in the first patient I presented. Ocular manifestations are well described and in many cases may be secondary to auto inoculation. Our ophthalmology colleagues have provided us ongoing assistance, examining many of these patients and providing advice and helping us ensure that so far, none of our patients have developed permanent vision issues. Finally, I wanna to touch just briefly on encephalitis, which is not something I've personally seen yet, but is a reported rare and potentially fatal complication of this disease. So far, there have been at least 15 worldwide deaths reported. And while we don't have a reported cause of death for all of them, at least three were attributed to encephalitis. And so it is something to be aware of and watch out for. And because of these unique and severe presentations, we have to be careful to think about our differential diagnosis. For a patient with a diffuse rash, it really does look like a lot of different sexually transmitted infections, things like syphilis, disseminated herpes, uh, varicella, a molluscum, disseminated gonorrhea, as well as this time of the year, enteroviral infections. For genital ulcer disease, you need to think about things like herpes, syphilis, chancroid, and LGV. And for proctitis, the differential includes herpes, gonorrhea, chlamydia, which should also include syphilis based on some of the updates to the 2021 STI or 2021 STI guidelines. What you can see is that many of the presentations of clinical syndromes overlap with sexually transmitted infections. And so you need to perform comprehensive STI testing in patients you're considering for human monkeypox virus. Not just is it on the differential, but these can actually be co-infections with many patients presenting with both uh, human monkeypox viral infection and sexually transmitted infections concurrently. So to briefly summarize the way it's presenting during this outbreak, it's primarily occurring among gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men, with a small number of infections spreading to women and children, primarily via household spread. The typical, uh, the prodrome may or may not be present and may also occur later in the course. The typical rash remains common, but is presenting atypically, often involving mucous membranes, starting in the genital and or perianal areas, Lesions can be scattered or diffuse and can be on just a specific body site with less total lesions, usually less than 10 compared to prior cohorts. Also, and importantly, lesions in different stages of progression can be seen side by side. So hopefully I've established that human monkeypox virus is presenting atypically and can be a devastating and painful disease. So how can we help patients present, prevent disease? Well, the first and usual best way to prevent disease is through vaccination. Dr. Barma is going to cover vaccine more in depth, and so I'm just going to hit some critical points. There are two main vaccines. The first is ACAM 2000, a second generation smallpox vaccine that is live vaccinia virus. You do get a lesion or a take at the inoculation site, and it requires one injection with a booster every three years, and it's not approved for those greater than 12 or less than 12 months. The Genios vaccine is our third generation smallpox vaccine. In this case, it's a live non-replicating virus, meaning it does not cause human disease. This requires two doses, four weeks apart, with maximum immunity occurring two weeks after the second dose. It requires a booster every two years and is approved for those aged greater than 18, although a recent EUA allowed for its use in pediatrics. The vaccine can be used for both PEP and PrEP, for PEP, it should be given as soon as possible after an exposure. And while there is no human efficacy data for PEP, non-human primate and other animal models suggest that giving the vaccine within four days may prevent disease, while giving it up to 14 days after an exposure may reduce symptoms. I'll also highlight here that for those that can't receive vaccination for PEP, or for whom vaccination would not be expected to elicit a good response, vaccine immune globulin is available through an investigational drug application through the CDC. For pre-exposure prophylaxis, the long-standing recommendation has been to vaccinate clinical and research lab workers and public health response team members. However, during this outbreak, we've started to vaccinate epidemiological risk groups, which I know Dr. Varma will cover in more depth. So how effective is vaccination? The truth is we have no idea. The best data we have, and when you hear the 85% effective number talked about, 
Please know that it's from patients from 1980 to 1984 in Africa, vaccinated with the prior generation of the smallpox vaccine. Hopefully observational studies from this current outbreak may give us a better sense of the effectiveness of vaccination for both PEP and PrEP. So we've talked about vaccination, but the other way to prevent infection is through changing activities and behavior. The CDC has put together several great resources, including this one on safer sex and monkeypox. And Dr. Daskalakis has made several videos and community engagement efforts to talk about how individuals can reduce their personal risk of acquiring human monkeypox virus. Finally, when it comes to prevention, I always get asked what I tell my patients. And the truth is it's similar to what I would tell them for anything. First, it's get vaccinated if you're eligible. Second, before engaging in sexual activity, talk with and check out your partner. It's always good practice to have open conversations about symptoms or exposures. Third is to examine yourself regularly and see your healthcare provider if you find anything suspicious. Fourth, help protect yourself and your community. If you're having prodromal symptoms and are at risk, please self-quarantine. Human monkeypox virus is unlikely if a rash does not appear within five days. Fifth, and I can't stress this one enough, but this is not something to be embarrassed about. It's transmitting in a similar way to many other sexually transmitted infections, and we need to all work to reduce the shame and stigma around this disease so people are not hesitant to come in and get tested. Finally, and most importantly, if you're ever unsure, come in, see your provider, and get tested. So now that we know what to look for and how to prevent it, if a patient comes in, how do we diagnose it? The most common way for diagnosis is a swab of the lesion that you can send to either a commercial lab or your public health lab. These lesions tend to have extremely high viral load, and so you don't need to unroof the lesion, but just swab them vigorously and then follow local procedures for what medium to put them in and sending them to the lab. It's good practice to swab at least two lesions as we've had some where one of the two lesions have tested negative. Serology exists with both IgM and IgG assays to the orthopox virus. In general, IgM turns positive about five days post-rash onset, while the IgG turns positive about eight days post-rash onset. It's unclear during this outbreak if that's truly from rash onset or could be from the onset of other symptoms if they start first. One of the challenges is that this assay cross-reacts with vaccinia virus. So after receiving the smallpox vaccine that many patients are now receiving, uh, serology would be expected to be positive. Finally, it's not easily commercially available, although it is available from the CDC if needed. In terms of the future of diagnosis, what we need are PCR from other compartments that's not currently commercially available, although there are some sites with lab-developed tests. Things like rectal swabs that may pick up disease prior to rash starting, throat swabs for the same reason, as well as looking at semen, urine, and blood to identify virus maybe before the rash starts. Now, if your patient is diagnosed with human monkeypox virus, what can we offer them and how can we treat them? The first and most important thing is that most patients fully recover with or without treatment. As we mentioned earlier, out of over 48,800 patients infected, only 15 have died. And however, as we also mentioned, there's considerable morbidity and supportive care can really help patients while they're recovering. Now, most of the symptomatic treatment recommendations are not strictly evidence-based, but a lot of them make sense and have been used for other diseases in the past. And the CDC really collated the experience from a variety of frontline providers to put together this Dear Colleague letter. Some of the recommendations that are really important from this letter or that we should be assessing pain in all patients and recognize that pain may exist from mucosal lesions not visible on exam, particularly in the rectum and pharynx. We should be using supportive care to manage pain. We need to stay in contact with patients regularly to assess their pain and adjust management, consider pain consults for refractory cases, and that treatment with antivirals may be indicated for pain control. So in terms of supportive care recommendations, supportive care recommendations include for proctitis, stool softeners to decrease pain when going to the bathroom, especially for patients who may end up on opioids. Topical agents like sitz baths and lidocaine gels have been effective. 
but be careful with local immunosuppressives with the potential to worsen disease like topical steroids. This also includes things like over-the-counter pain relievers like NSAIDs if patients are not bleeding or Tylenol. And finally, prescription analgesics like gabapentin and or opioids. I always recommend care and consideration with opioids due to the risk of opioid-induced constipation making things worse, but there are patients whose pain we've been unable to control in any other way. For genital lesions, we've recommended primarily keeping them clean because the biggest complication has been infection. So frequent bathing and frequent changes of clothing can help prevent infection. For patients who are infected, both systemic and topical antibiotics have been helpful, as well as wet to dry dressing, dressings for patients who need mild debridement. For pharyngeal disease, we also have topical agents like viscous lidocaine and saltwater gargles, as well as over-the-counter prescription pain relief. So supportive care works for some, but not all patients. Some patients do require antiviral medication. At one point, New York City estimated that about 25% of patients testing positive required antiviral treatment. In terms of indications for treatment, there are three main categories. Severe disease or patients presenting with sepsis requiring hospitalization, evidence of viremia, or lesions in concerning locations like the eye, pharynx, rectum, urethra, and vagina. Patients with illness complications, like secondary infections, proctitis with tenesmus, uncontrolled pain, rectal bleeding, gastroenteritis, pneumonia, and encephalitis. And finally, our group of people at risk of severe disease, which includes persons living with HIV, with low CD4 count or high viral load, individuals who are severely immunocompromised, children less than eight years of age, pregnant women, individuals with exfoliative skin condition, and those at increased risk of complications like inflammatory bowel diseases. In terms of antivirals, there are three systemic and one topical that I'll review. Remember that orthopox viruses are not herpes viruses, and acyclovir, which requires phosphorylation, is not going to be active. However, both sodafovir and brinsodafovir are potential agents against orthopox viruses. Sodafovir and brinsodafovir act as a competitive inhibitor or an alternative substrate for DNA polymerase, they get incorporated into the growing DNA strand and block further viral DNA synthesis, leading to non-productive infection. However, given the low overall mortality of this disease and the significant risk of renal injury with sodafovir, this drug has rarely been used in this setting, except in a few extremely immunocompromised patients. Bring sodafovir is similar. It has a side chain that gets cleaved, releasing sodafovir, that is thought to have less renal toxicity. However, in England, the first three patients that were treated with oral brinsodafovir about seven days after the onset of rash, all three patients developed elevated liver enzymes and none were able to complete the course of treatment, dampening enthusiasm for this agent, although it remains available through an IND from the Strategic National Stockpile. Next and briefly are trifluoridine drops. These drops are FDA approved for herpes infection of the eye and are thought to have some activity against orthopox viruses. There's no clinical data on these. However, they've been recommended by the CDC in most cases of severe ocular disease and have been used in Africa for similar infections of the eye. Um, anecdotally, the response has been positive. And so I wanna highlight that for providers who may not be aware of this resource. Finally is tecoviramat, which is an antiviral drug initially developed against variola to treat smallpox infection. As per the earlier question, this is the drug that's being recommended for most patients during the course of this outbreak. It's a novel drug in that it works by inhibiting a viral protein called P37. This protein is highly conserved in orthopox viruses, allowing this drug to have in vitro activity against most orthopox viruses. P37 is involved in the final step of viral maturation, the formation of enveloped virus. It's actually required for intracellular mature virus to form intracellular enveloped virus required for completing maturation and leaving the cell. The P37 protein is specific to orthopox viruses, making it highly selective, and the, but not having the ability to work on other classes of viruses, including herpes viruses. This drug was approved in 2018 via the FDA animal rule, which allows a pathway for approval of drugs for severe or life-threatening conditions 
when it's not ethical or feasible to conduct efficacy trials in humans. So this drug was approved for smallpox because we can't conduct, a, we can't do a feasible trial of smallpox in people. However, because it was approved through the animal rule for smallpox, we have extremely limited human data on this medication. Efficacy data was done entirely through animal studies. And this is the human safety study that led to its approval. 359 patients with only one serious adverse event that was not attributed to the drug. In terms of efficacy prior to this outbreak, there was really just this one paper, the one that included a seven patient case series, including the three who got burned sidopavir. One patient was treated with tegoviramat and experienced no adverse effects and had a shorter duration of viral shedding and illness. But again, that's just a single patient. During the course of this outbreak, New York City reports that they've given out over a thousand courses of tegoviramat. And so we'll expect that across the country, more uh, observational data about this drug will appear. And we're starting to see that. In the last week or two, there was a case series of two, pa two patients whose practice improved on tegoviramat was published as well as a case series of 26 cases of patients receiving tecoviramet. However, these case reports don't remove the need for a clinical trial that can help us definitively know if the drug works and is safe. We need to know if the virus develops resistance to the drug, as there's also a case report that when the drug was used against the disseminated vaccine infection in an immunocompromised host, they developed resistance. We need to find markers for improvement so that we can identify other promising drugs. And finally, and most importantly, if this drug doesn't work, we're spending time and money that could be used to find drugs that do. And the good news is that clinical trials are on the way. The UK group enrolled their first patient last week. There's a planned trial for the Democratic Republic of the Congo and the US trial being funded by the NIH and managed by the AIDS Clinical Trials Group uh, will hopefully be enrolling patients in the next one to two weeks. Meaning it's a great time to remind providers to refer patients to this study if they can. If you want to be able to give tecoviramat, it's currently available through the CDC investigational drug platform and through your local health department. The recommendation is to contact your local health department. And I'll give one more plug for local STD prevention training centers that have a grant to provide technical assistance around human monkeypox virus and can help you establish a treatment program if health is needed. So finally, when my patients are diagnosed, what do I tell them? Well, I tell them that we have supportive care options for most patients and treatment options for patients with severe disease. I recommend that they stay home and separate from other people in their household. If they can't fully separate from others, they should wear a face mask, avoid physical contact, and cover their lesions when in shared spaces. If they have to leave home for food or medical visits, they should make sure to cover their rash and lesions with clothing and wear a face mask. And the big question I always get from my patients is when can they have sex again after human monkeypox virus? And the honest answer is that we don't know. Currently, there's very little data, but I hope that in the near future, some of these RCTs will help answer these questions. For now, I recommend considering condoms for a minimum of eight weeks after infection and, the, and let the patients know that the WHO actually says to consider condoms for a minimum of 12 weeks after recovery and go through a shared decision-making process with my patients. I do want to talk briefly about two specific special populations before I wrap up. The first is pediatrics. As we said earlier, there have only been 17 total cases under the age of 17, most reportedly from household transmission. While we don't have a lot of data on pediatric disease, the data we do have suggests it may be more severe in unvaccinated children, hence the indication for treatment for children less than eight years of age. In this study from the 1980 to 1984 outbreak showed that children age four and below had a mortality of almost 15% compared to six and a half percent for those aged five to nine and zero for those aged 10 and greater. It's important when we look at those numbers to remember that this was clade one virus with a higher mortality rate, but it does suggest the disease may be worse in children. Additionally, in the 2003 US prairie dog outbreak, 29% of patients were pediatric patients, and these patients were more likely to be in the intensive care unit. While ICU decisions may reflect a difference in the standard of care, the two most critically ill patients in that outbreak were two school-aged children, one with encephalopathy and one with a retropharyngeal abscess, again suggesting that children may be worse with this disease. In terms of presentation during this outbreak, I don't think we know yet. 
Given the limited number of cases, we don't know if this disease will present different or similar to that of previous outbreaks. I can tell you that in the case of human monkeypox virus with this picture to the right, it did not follow the classic course, starting first with a lesion on the scalp, then progressing to the prodrome, then progressing to disseminated lesions. And I wanna highlight in children, especially this time of year, that human monkeypox virus can look a lot like hand, foot, and mouth disease. I'm probably getting one call a day from a provider about this differential. And it can be hard to distinguish, especially when you look at that bottom right picture. It's important to remember that right now, patients without an epidemiological link to a human monkeypox virus case are unlikely to have it. What I've been recommending is that if it looks like classic hand, foot, and mouth, test for that, and if negative, consider testing for human monkeypox virus. Conversely, trust your instincts. Many pediatric providers have seen many hand, foot, and mouth diseases over the years. And if it doesn't look classic or something that feels off, test for both to be safe as you don't wanna miss it. As I mentioned earlier, there was an emergency youth authorization earlier this year that allows for giving of the Genios vaccine to children under age 18 without an IND, making it readily available for post-exposure prophylaxis. And finally, all of the treatment options we discussed earlier are available for pediatric patients. However, in most cases, there's little to no human pediatric efficacy data, and most of the pediatric dosing data is based on pharmacologic modeling only. Since it's the fall, another question I can't avoid talking about is whether or not we'll see this disease on college campuses. And the short answer is that we already have. College campuses are often many cities, and so it's not surprising that cases will occur. But again, I would not get substantially alarmed. In terms of counseling college students, I say the same things I tell any sexually active patient about preventing this disease. In addition, it's also a great opportunity to talk about overall sexual health and HIV and STI prevention in college-age kids, a group with some of the highest rates of STIs at baseline. We do need to remind patients that transmission can occur through non-sexual close physical contact like kissing and cuddling, and transmission rarely but may occur through sharing of unwashed clothing or sleeping in someone's bed. And I do wanna give a shout out to College Health Services, which on many campuses are absolutely amazing and can already test for human monkeypox virus. The last special population is pregnant patients. In this case, we can't say that overall everyone does well, as in the limited cases reported, there is concern for both a high rate of miscarriage as well as the risk of vertical transmission. While we wanna treat pregnant women, we actually have limited options. In animal models, sidofovir is associated with embryo toxicity and teratogenicity, while Britain sidofovir demonstrated something similar as well as structural malformations. Tecoviramat appeared safe in animal models and is the recommended treatment for pregnant women during this outbreak. But as a reminder, we don't have any uh, human efficacy or human safety data in pregnant women. And so just to wrap up, in summary, the 2022 human monkeypox virus outbreak is spreading rapidly and can be serious. It's not presenting classically, but presenting in sexual health and HIV, HIV prevention settings, with genital urinary, rectal, and pharyngeal complaints being common. It can commonly look like or be confused with other sexually transmitted infections, and so you need to take a detailed sexual history and exposure history. It can present concurrently with other STIs, so don't forget about complete STI testing. Have a very low threshold to think about this disease in patients with a rash. We have supportive care options for most patients and treatment options for patients who need it. It takes a team to treat patients with monkeypox, so don't forget to ask for subspecialty assistance. More studies are needed to better understand the transmission dynamics, treatment options, and long-term outcome of this disease and are getting started now. And this disease can be severe and patients remain grateful for our support. To go to our questions again, you have a patient who presents with human monkeypox virus, which has been confirmed via assay. Which of the following medications is recommended as the first line for this patient requiring treatment?
And it looks like 90% said tecoviramat, which is the correct answer. And so just as a reminder, acyclovir, due to its need for phosphorylation by viral kinases, it's much more effective against herpes viruses than pox virus infections. Sidafavir is likely to have activity, but concerns about nephrotoxicity limit its generalized use. Rinsidafavir is also likely to have activity, but again, concerns about hepatotoxicity limit its generalized use. Tecoviramat has been recommended during this outbreak. However, we have limited safety data and no human efficacy data to date. And vaccine immunoglobulin actually has no proven benefit, but it is being used and recommended for PEP in individuals who cannot receive vaccination for post-exposure prophylaxis. So the next question is, you have a patient that is asking you how you can prevent getting human monkeypox virus. Which of the following ways do you tell him is the most common way human monkeypox virus is spread during this current outbreak? And we're at 100% correct, which is similar to the pretest, and that is correct. And I think we went through this a lot, but direct contact with infected lesions or body fluids from a person who has monkeypox is consistent with the epidemiology of this outbreak. With both contaminated towels and prolonged face-to-face -face encounters, you would really expect a greater diversity of demographics infected, as well as a, a greater uh, diversity of locations where uh, patients are coming down with infection. And I want to thank you all very much, and I'll turn it over to our moderators now. Jason, thank you so much. That was really fantastic. I'll just echo, you know, the, the comments in the chat from several people. Thank you for your sharing your expertise and, and your clinical experience with us all. So we have lots of questions, lots of great questions submitted both in advance and uh, in the Q&A box. So feel free to continue to submit your questions and Haiti and I will try to get to as many as I can. So Haiti, maybe I'll start things off with uh, a simple question, easy one for you, Jason. Um, why now? Is something change with the virus? <laughs> is it, you know, travel? What caused the current outbreak? I don't think we know yet what caused the current outbreak. I think, you know, there's probably a lot of different factors involved, um, including sort of the introduction of this virus into a sort of a, a sexual network where there's an opportunity to potentially propagate. And I think that that probably has something to do with it, as well as international travel reopening after COVID, as well as we're a more interconnected world than we've ever been before. And it's a great reminder that infectious diseases are never local. Something that happens on one side of the world can very quickly spread as we've seen now multiple times in the past few years. All right, I'll ask the next question for Dr. Zucker. Um, so this is a question I've heard also come through through my own clinic. Um, confirming the diagnosis and actually accounting for the extent of the epidemic's importance, but balancing with clinical demands, Clinically, if a patient is only mildly symptomatic, do they need to be evaluated? So I, in general, recommend swabbing everyone for uh, human monkeypox virus where you're concerned about. And there's a couple reasons for that. The first is that patients who may have mild disease may go on to severe disease later, and we've seen that in numerous patients. Having that diagnosis already made is helpful when you're evaluating for a treatment. The other reason is that there is a differential in these things. The virus can look like a lot of other things, including other sexually transmitted infections, and can exist and be co-infected with other sexually transmitted infections. And so bringing these patients in for complete STI testing as well is also an important part of the process. And so I, in general, recommend bringing all these patients in for testing um, and then testing them for human monkeypox virus while they're there. All right, Jason, there's a number of questions related to uh, epidemiological risk and, and yeah. transmission. So there may be two related questions I'll try to combine. Yeah. Um, given what you said about transmission, are we doing a disservice by suggesting that, quote unquote, everyone might get this infection? And um, sort of the flip side is, is it possible that people are just not recognizing in women because we're not thinking about testing women? Yes and yes. <laughs> um, I think it's hard because you want to avoid stigmatizing any particular groups because that goes back to that sort of shame factor. If you stigmatize these things, people don't wanna come forward and they don't wanna get tested and they don't wanna be diagnosed. At the same time, you wanna let people in the highest epidemiological risk groups 
know that they're at risk so that they can take proper precautions for themselves and, ma and manage their own risk profile. Um, in terms of women, I think absolutely we're probably under testing women. We have seen an increasing number of women uh, coming in with symptoms who don't get diagnosed at the first visit, but got, that get diagnosed at a follow-up visit, very similar to how this was in men who have sex with men at the start of the epidemic. Um, now I think more people are sort of aware of that group, but are maybe not as aware looking forward in women. And so I certainly think that we need to have a higher index of suspicion and test women who may be at risk. All right, so we do have a couple questions about pediatric patients. So I know you did touch on this topic mm -hmm. a little bit, um, but one of the other questions we got was, and if, if a monkeypox case were to occur in a school age child, mm -hmm. uh, what advice would you offer to school leaders, parents of classmates? And a couple questions also came up that asked, how could we avoid pediatricians being inundated by common pediatric rashes? The second one, I don't have a great answer for. <laughs> um, I don't know how we stop pediatricians from getting inundated because people will worry. And, you know, pediatricians are, are sort of used to parents worrying about their children with, rat, with fevers and other things. And I think this is going to be part of that process. In terms of recommendations for administration, you know, this is not an easy virus to pass from one person to another. We've seen an outbreak in a daycare setting where there was an employee there who was positive, where none of the children ended up testing positive. I think if there's a child at school who tests positive, the most important things you can do are offer PEP vaccination to people who want it and provide counseling on what to look for. For individuals with prodromal symptoms, which again, can be normal pediatric viruses, but with prodromal symptoms, I would consider holding them out for five days, but I wouldn't shut down school. I wouldn't sort of do anything like that. I think it's all gonna be, it, it's not as likely to turn into a large outbreak as things like COVID-19 were. Thanks, Jason. Um, What's the current thinking about whether there might be any residual protection for, for those of us who were vaccinated against smallpox in the you know, 50s and 60s? Yeah, I think we don't know the final answer to that question. The suspicion is that there's probably some protection. But then again, the current recommendations for the CD, from the CDC are that if you haven't been vaccinated within the last three years, you really should get vaccinated again if you're in an at-risk group. There's a couple questions that came up regarding isolation. So mm -hmm. as our typical guidelines recommend um, people coming back to work and common places after scabs and skin is healed. A couple of people are asking if that's necessary, if there's areas where if their scabs or lesions are completely covered, would it be safe for them to return to work earlier given financial stress um, because of this disease? I think the financial stress is a huge problem. I think at this point, it's very early on in our understanding of this disease to say that, you know, sending people back to work with covered lesions is completely safe. And for that, I'm going to refer you to your infection prevention and control department, because when I comment on infection prevention and control, I end up in trouble. Um, what I will say is that, you know, we need to provide the ability for these patients to isolate safely. We need to provide, you know, uh, financial assistance, food assistance, housing assistance, so that patients have the ability to isolate safely, so they don't feel like they're forced to leave their home. Uh, to go to work and show up the thing. And that's the fastest way we're going to end this epidemic is to be allowing patients to isolate safely until they're no longer infectious. All right, maybe we could uh, pivot to diagnosis. There are mm -hmm. uh, several questions related to proper sampling techniques. You need to mm -hmm. unroof uh, a lesion to get mm -hmm. an adequate specimen. Uh, what about the exanthem? Can you swab those lesions? And um, also just about... I'll, I'll, let me ask two other related things. I can repeat them if I need to. Uh, um, can you do it, send a rectal swab and someone doesn't have lesions? And then um, should you be using two different swabs in two different sites to avoid inoculating you know, a different area? So yep. it's unroofing, uh, the exanthem, yep. the rectal swab, and then two swabs for two lesions. Yeah. So I'll start with the easy questions first. You know, these lesions have a lot of virus in them and have very low CT values reflecting very high viral loads. You do not need to unroof them to get a good sample. You just need to be able to swab vigorously over the top. And I agree that you should use two different swabs for two different sites to avoid auto inoculation. Um, in terms of the rectal swabs, you know, none of the commercial labs in the US are approved for blind rectal swabs. This has come up on numerous calls because I think many of us in the sexual health field have had patients who presented with proctitis only, 
tested negative for the usual causes of proctitis in a sexual health setting. And our suspicion was pretty high for human monkeypox virus, but we were not able to make the diagnosis. In Europe and Canada, they are able to do blind rectal swabs and they do find patients who test positive without having a rash or other symptoms, at least at the time they present. Although many of those patients will go on to develop a rash. Um, so I think it would be great to be able to do that, but none of the labs are validated for that currently, although some local labs and lab, local developed tests are. Um, in terms of swabbing the exanthem, I don't know if I've seen anything on that in particular. You can do pharyngeal swabs. Again, in other countries, they've done that, but I've not seen anything for the rash, uh, for like the, the viral exanthem like picture itself. All right, so there's a few questions regarding manifestations, specifically neurological manifestations. So a few people ask, what are the neurological manifestations in monkeypox? Um, how are they managed? And do patients who develop things like encephalitis or other severe complications, do these patients tend to have immunosuppression? So again, we don't have a lot of data on the neurological manifestations other than that they can be devastating. Um, these patients have all been, been managed with IV ticlovirumab, as best I can tell, um, in an attempt to try to manage it. Um, the presentation has primarily been encephalitis or encephalopathy. And at least one of the three who passed away did not have any reported immunocompromise. Um, I think that's the best I have on the neurologic complications right now. It's an area that I know the CDC is very interested in learning more about because it's been reported both in this and prior outbreaks. But again, given the limited number of cases, it's very hard to sort of know more about it. All right, Jason, um, a couple of questions related to mucosal involvement. Do the lesions manifest only at the area of transmission or can there be lesions that develop more distantly? And then um, this question from a dentist actually that um, can the initial presentation only have oral lesions without any skin rash? So absolutely. So the initial presentation can definitely present with pharyngeal or oral lesions without the skin rash. In all the cases I've seen so far, the skin rash did go on to develop later, but certainly pharyngeal lesions can be the presenting symptom. Um, I apologize. Can you repeat the first question again? Uh, Sorry, just related it. to the, the site of inoculation. Oh, got it. Yes. Right. So I, I think we don't fully know the answer to that. We believe that the site of inoculation is sort of where the first lesions occur. But certainly we're seeing patients have mucosal lesions, although probably less frequently in distant sites, particularly patients who are developing new lesions on the eye. Um, they may be getting it either from auto inoculation or just because they're developing those lesions later on in the process. Okay, so you may have touched on this briefly, but we talked about that non-specific viral exanthem. So mm -hmm. a question came in asking if patients with monkeypox who develop that nonspecific viral exanthem, if they always go on to develop the classic lesions of monkeypox, or is it often or rarely limited to that unusual exanthem? It's a great question. I don't think we know yet. All of the ones we've seen and all of the ones in a few different case series that I know have recently been submitted for publication, all went on to develop uh, the classic rash in one area or another. Um, I think it's a great question, something we'll have to figure out in the future about whether patients can have just the exanthem and not develop it. You know, currently in this country, we wouldn't even have the ability to test them for that. So I'm not sure we'd know so far, but certainly a great question and something worth figuring out in the future. There may be one last question about the clinical manifestations. Mm -hmm. uh, could you elaborate on the uh, ophthalmologic manifestations? Yeah, so we've seen a wide variety of ophthalmologic manifestations. We've seen conjunctivitis. Uh, we've seen lesions sort of um, in the middle of the eye. We've seen lesions directly on the conjunctiva as well. Um, and so we've seen a variety of different lesions. In Africa, the biggest concern seems to be corneal scarring, which luckily we have not seen so far, but I know is something that's certainly of concern. All right, moving a little bit more to treatment care. Um, can you talk a little about, Jason, about the role, if there is any, of telemedicine and seeing patients, treating patients with monkeypox? Yeah, I think telemedicine is really helpful um, and has made it a lot easier, particularly with the current Tecoviramat IND. You know, we, have, we at our site primarily do our initial visits in person in large part so that we can A, complete uh, monkeypox virus testing that hasn't been done already, but also to get complete STI testing 
and to be able to do a full exam and things like that. However, for the majority of our patients for follow-up, we do all of our follow-up visits via telemedicine because uh, it makes it a lot easier. Patients don't have to travel, can remain isolated. Uh, we don't have to deal with the clinic precautions and things like that. And for many patients, if they're just improving, there really isn't a need for them to come back in. Obviously, for patients who are developing worsening lesions, lesions at new sites or concerning symptoms, we'll obviously bring them back in for an in-person visit. But a lot of the follow-up can definitely be done via telemedicine. I also think that for patients who get a full workup um, in your ED or your urgent care can potentially also be started or done initially via telemedicine, as long as you know that that initial workup was completed. So Jason, let's talk about the duration of a tech sure. um, Are there patients uh, where you or you've seen data on shortening the duration when the lesions have all kind of healed and crusted over? And on the flip side, are there patients for whom you would extend therapy? What would those indications be? So currently there's no data on shortening therapy. And given just the lack of data, I would sort of be hesitant at this point to do that. Um, not for any reason other than, you know, we have such limited data on 14 days, we have even less data on doing seven or 10 days. In terms of prolonged uh, treatment, you know, people have done that for patients who start to improve later in the course of ticlovirumab treatment, and I think that's reasonable. Also for individuals with infection at sort of more protected sites, so for example, the patient I showed you with a perichondritis or infection of the ear really started improving later in the course of illness and has a site that we know is hard to get drugs to, whether it's antibiotics or antivirals. And so we're treating him with a longer course as well, and he seems to be doing well. Um, but in most pa cases where patients are improving pretty uh, improving after starting treatment, we've not extended the courses. While we're on the topic of ticlovirumab, there's a couple of questions that talk about when do you need to start antiviral therapy on a patient? And in the same, under the same topic, um, are supplies of the antiviral constrained? Do we need novel agents? Mm -hmm. So, you know, the three criteria I listed earlier were patients with severe illness, patients at risk of severe illness, um, and patients with complications of the disease who would all qualify for ticlovirumab under the current IND. I think some of the current randomized controlled trials will help us better understand if there's a role for this drug earlier as well. Um, in terms of acquiring it, my understanding is that there's not a shortage of the drug, but it is a process with the investigational drug application to complete the paperwork and other needed stuff to get it. You also need to work closely with your local health department that really controls the supply, because some jurisdictions like New York City are allowing the supplies to be available on site, while other jurisdictions are requiring you to get it from the CDC for each individual patient. And so that's going to be a very local process. So Jason, you, you were sort of modest when you, you touched on the um, AIDS clinical trials group protocol for uh, Tecovirumab, which is hopefully going to start imminently, that you're a vice chair of that protocol. My understanding is that is intended to support uh, FDA, full FDA approval of Tecovirumab, but do, is there some, um, anything you can predict, I guess, about future access, you know, that trial will obviously take a few months to complete. Um, I don't think, I mean, we, wanted, we want to start and enroll in the trial as quickly as possible. Um, I don't know exactly how long it will take us to fully enroll, uh, but the hope is that at the end of that, we'll have enough data for potentially an FDA approval so the drug is easier to obtain. So would you envision that uh, there were a few people, I think, in the, the chat or the Q&A yeah. that were sort of bemoaning what has to be done now mm -hmm. for someone to access treatment? And obviously, there's some inequities yeah. in terms of access. Do you anticipate that there'll be any change until there are, you know, before there are randomized control data? It's hard to predict from the FDA. You know, the FDA has been pretty steadfast in their concern about resistance and concern about providing an EUA before there was any human efficacy data from a randomized control trial. It's possible that, you know, either interim data from a trial or the final data of a trial could lead first to an EUA before full FDA approval. But I think that will really be up to the FDA to decide what they're most comfortable with. But I think the hope is that the more of this drug we use, the more safety data we can collect and the more efficacy data we can collect can allow us to make this process easier. Because as a provider myself, it certainly is a cumbersome process that you and I have talked about many times, it takes a lot of time. Just to say, we're, we're almost at 2.15, but I think if, if Dr. Zucker is able to stay on and, and yep. people have, you know, we'll try to get through at least a few more questions and stay on for a little bit longer. Yep. But, um, and, and as Tammy's reminding everyone in the chat to please submit uh, questions via the Q&A and, and do the evaluations uh, later. 
Katie, do you want to go ahead? So there's a couple of questions about your clinic flow, I think are pretty interesting. So um, someone's asking if you can tell them about your clinic flow regarding seeing patients with monkeypox. You ever, does everyone wear full PPE? Does mm -hmm. everyone feel safe? So, you know, throughout this outbreak and prior outbreaks, healthcare worker transmission of this virus is exceptionally rare, even including in cases where the diagnosis was made later and people did their exams without full PPE. And so I think for that reason, most of, in our clinic at least, have felt very comfortable managing patients with this disease. Our normal flow is that somebody at the front desk is doing triage and will ask patients about any rash, unusual lesion, bumps. They have a few other words they use to try to make sure they get anything the patient might be thinking of. And if patients report that at all, they immediately go directly into a room where they'll be seen by a provider in full PPE who will then assess them. We'd rather unnecessarily room people uh, with something that may not be monkeypox than to have them go to the waiting room and miss it. And so we put them there and then allow the providers to go in and assess. Um, our providers wear full PPE um, as recommended by the CDC whenever performing exams on a patient uh, with a potential monkeypox rash. Okay, there's a, a question about um, the, you know, the relatively high frequency, I guess, of inconclusive PCR tests. And uh, if someone, you know, has a compatible clinical presentation mm -hmm. and they end up with such a result, you know, how does Tecaviramat uh, treatment work in that setting? Yeah. Or not work, but how do you, how do you approach Tecaviramat treatment in that setting? Um, so I think the first thing is that, you know, it's one of the advantages of doing two swabs is to hopefully get one that's not inconclusive, because we are seeing either negatives or inconclusives with that. The other thing I'll say is that if you're using one of the more flexible swabs and you're unable to swab vigorously, there have been reports of those presenting with more inconclusive results. And so that might just be something to think about to reduce the number of inconclusives. With that said, you know, you don't need a positive test to initiate therapy with Ticoviramat. If you have a patient with a strong clinical suspicion, uh, potentially you've ruled out other causes and you really believe that's the diagnosis, I don't think it's unreasonable to start ticoviramet therapy. I'll tell you that in our clinic, the majority of patients, because of the delay in getting results back, start before we have the result anyway. And so we're starting based empirically on our clinical suspicion. There's a few questions about Laundering, and I think that probably also spreads to disinfection of surfaces and things like that. Could you comment on that? Um, sure. Um, so, you know, we do know that it can spread via fomites, uh, usually soft, porous items like linens or clothing. Um, but again, we're not seeing that as being a primary driver of spread. And so it's important to know that, you know, if you, if you work in a hotel, for example, you might want to consider wearing gloves when handling soiled linen, but it's not something you, you really have to be very concerned about because it's just not something we're seeing as a mechanism of spread. So coming back to, to transmission and manifestations, yeah. is it known whether the exanthem, the lesions in the exanthem are contagious? I don't think we know that yet. You know, the, the exanthem hadn't really been reported prior to this outbreak. It's being reported from a few different um, academic medical centers now, but I don't know if anyone has swabbed the exanthem itself to see whether or not it's contagious. I have not, but now I might. There are a few questions about suspicions for tecoviramat resistance. Is mm -hmm. there any thought about having more information about that in the future? Or is there any thought that you have now on that? Um, in terms of tecoviramat resistance, you know, most of the concern comes from this paper that looked at using tecoviramat to treat a vaccine infection in a patient who is immunocompromised that did develop resistance. We do know what the sort of, at least one mechanism of potential resistance, but we don't know because we haven't used it on a large scale, how much we'll see in clinical practice. And so one of the things the CDC has been talking about is for patients who present with recrudescent disease, making sure that you swab it and making sure you talk to either your local health department or the CDC about potentially sequencing it to look for any of these resistance markers or this one resistance marker. Uh, Jason, can you touch on asymptomatic infection and what's known, if anything, about transmission from someone who's asymptomatic? So I don't think we know yet, but I will tell you that anecdotally, many of my patients tell me that their partners, especially the ones where they know their partners, did not have any lesions at the time. And so the suspicion is that you can have asymptomatic spread. Whether it's truly asymptomatic where you don't have any painless oral lesions, for example, I don't think we know yet. 
but it certainly seems like you can have asymptomatic spread based on what patients are telling us. I'll also say there was that Belgium paper that many people had seen where they ran PCRs for human monkeypox virus on sort of um, rectal swabs that they'd collected for regular STI testing. And they did find evidence of the virus in that setting of patients who did not have any symptoms. Again, whether that's remnant virus, infectious virus, or other things, we don't know, but we know that virus was found there. Jason, would you mind giving us an example of maybe some of your patients or a few of them who have severe pain regarding rectal lesions or oral lesions? What kind of complex regimen or, or, or regimen at all do you often put them on? Yep. So I often do all the things listed on my slide. So, you know, I start with stools. For patients with proctitis, I start with stool softeners to try to reduce the amount of strain and stress when they're going to the bathroom. I'll often recommend sitz baths as well as lidocaine gel. Um, I start with over-the-counter medications, either NSAIDs if they're not bleeding or Tylenol if they are, and if that fails, either gabapentin and if that fails, opioids. Um, and we have had patients who actually had to be admitted to the hospital for complex pain control. So Dr. Varma will we'll touch on vaccination in, in more detail, but there was a, an interesting question that's worth addressing today about um, anxiety among healthcare workers who are seeing people with a human monkeypox infection and requesting vaccination. And um, you know, the, the person posing the question's understanding is that infection among healthcare workers uh, has been rare and generally community acquired. So can you talk about that? Um, I think that's right. Uh, infection among healthcare workers has been extremely rare. I had heard a rumor about one case and haven't even seen it reported yet among healthcare workers worldwide. And so acquiring it through their jobs has been exceptionally rare, um, although some healthcare workers, as you said, have acquired it uh, through their personal life. Um, yeah, I think, you know, in terms of vaccination, they're not currently offering it to healthcare workers who don't meet uh, risk criteria outside of work. And that's in large part because the vaccine is limited. And so we really need to be giving it to the people who are at highest risk of acquiring this disease, which healthcare workers are not necessarily just by being a healthcare worker. I suspect we probably don't know the answer to this quite yet, but there are a few questions regarding protection from infection. If these patients who are infected, if they should go on to get the vaccine, if so, when, or if once you're infected, you have protection for a suspected amount of time and don't need it, things like that. So after infection, you probably have protection for some period of time. I don't think we currently know what that period of time is. My current recommendation to my patients who've been infected is to get vaccinated when the vaccine supplies catch up with demand. So right now they're probably protected and the best thing they can do is allow people who are at risk to take those vaccines. Uh, but when uh, supply catches up with demand, it'd be very reasonable for them to get vaccinated as we don't know how long uh, immunity after infection lasts for. Okay, so maybe we'll take one or two more questions. Um, they keep coming in and there's, there's so many good ones. I apologize again that we won't be able to get to all of them. Uh, what's the current management option for someone with massively enlarged fluctuant lymph nodes related to monkeypox? I don't think there's one one recommendation. Um, you know, if it's causing them significant pain, um, I probably would consider tecoviramat for them um, to start with. The other thing is to look for bacterial superinfection nearby that could be contributing to making them both more painful um, and then consider antibiotics if so. Um, otherwise, it's really a case-by-case -case question. I don't think there's anything in general I do unless I see something else going on. Someone was curious, and myself included, about that photo you placed of the significant penile lesion that was sent to urology. Do you remember if the urologist said any, anything specific, if they had any specific recommendations? Yeah. So the first things the urologist did for me was provide supportive care to me. Um, we've had a lot of really complex penile lesions. And they sort of told me up front that they were going to get better, and they were right. So in spite of seeing all these complex penile lesions, we've not admitted any of them to the hospital. And we've managed them all with local wound care, like wet to dry dressings, topical antibiotics, and systemic antibiotics. Um, and they have all gotten better. There is some small amount of scarring, as would be expected in sort of the size of these lesions. But they all have gotten better, and patients have regained full function, which is also incredibly important to our population. 
All right, well, we've gone about 10 minutes over, but I uh, really wanted to uh, thank everybody for their participation. Thank Dr. Sucker for really a tremendous um, presentation and, and great job with the Q&A. And thank my um, co-moderator, uh, Haiti Torres, as well as the ISUSA staff. And please come back Thursday, same time, for Dr. Jay Varma, who will be tackling uh, issues related to vaccination, public health response, et cetera. I think it might be another great afternoon. So thank you all. Thanks, everybody. And Jose, do you have yes. anything remarks? Thank you again, Dr. Zucker, for your exceptional clinical update on monkeypox and for Drs. Gillespie and Torres for our robust discussion. As a reminder to our audience, information and how to claim continuing education credits will be emailed, be emailed by 5 p.m. Pacific time tomorrow, and this will enable us to review all of those that have attended today's live broadcast. As a, as a reminder, registration for part two of the two-part Monkey Pox webinar series is open for registration. Please visit the IAS USA website for more information. Here are a list of upcoming webinars that we have lined up for the months of September and October. And we have a couple courses coming up next week. We have our 30th annual update on HIV management in Los Angeles, California. Registration is still open, so please visit our website for more information. We have another annual update on um, HIV management in Chicago, Illinois, scheduled for December 8th. And if you are uh, wanting to hear more about uh, monkeypox update, uh, we have a upcoming dialogue this September, um, and we will have discussions, Dr. Peter Chin Hong, Yvonne Maldonado, and Michael M. S. Sag, and it will be moderated by Paul Holberding. And our annual Ryan White HIV AIDS Clinical Conference um, is open for registration. And for CROI 2023, general abstract and scholarship submissions are now open. For more information, please visit the website. Thank you, everyone. And this concludes today's webinar.